Well, hi, everyone. And thank you so much uh, for choosing to spend an hour listening to me. I'm, I'm a bit overwhelmed by how many of you are here tonight, but I'm um, really gratified that there's so much interest in the history of our city and especially our library. It's something really, really near and dear to my heart. So thank you very much. Um, the topic tonight is uh, the story of the library that never was. And what we're talking about is a library building that was envisioned, that was hoped for, that was planned, that was designed, but all of the elements of it never came to be for a variety of reasons. And we'll talk about who contributed to this and what some of those wonderful ideas were. But the fun thing is why this talk, why now? And really, um, as Summer said, it's come out of discoveries from the basement. Um, and we call it spelunking, <laughs> going down there and digging around. And to be honest, um, there are things down there that we have found uh, locked away, safely protected, that really we didn't realize were there. So we knew that we had blueprints and architectural drawings and things of the expansion era, era library, the more modern years of the library, but we didn't realize how much we had of the original construction. So some of the kinds of things that we found, of course, are daily construction logs, records of some 58 subcontractors, uh, notes back and forth, memos back and forth. But the things that I find the most fascinating are the architectural drawings uh, that were done originally and all the myriad iterations. And of course, um, the very, very special correspondence between the architect who designed the building and saw it to fruition and our uh, former librarian who's now long, long, has long left us, uh, Walter Johnson. And the relationship between these two men is just fascinating. And one of those things you really get an insight to when you get to read their letters, you know? And as an historian, I'm pretty sure I got into this just because I'm nosy. Um, but, you know, they're both past, so it's okay to read their mail now. So with that, I'm going to um, switch over, hopefully this will work, to uh, some PowerPoint images, because I think it's more interesting to look at some of these pictures than it is to look at me. So with that, I'm going to give this a try. Summer assures me this will work. Let me take off my glasses so I can see what I'm doing. And let me move this up. And we're going to go here. Open up, here we go. Switch it to a slideshow. And does it look like a slideshow? Not yet. There we go. <clears throat> so can everyone see the first image? Awesome, there's Summer doing this. Um, the idea that there was a library that never was um, sort of builds way back from the notion that there is now a library that, that is. Um, the library that never was culminates from uh, what we had that was a library that was, that was expanded on significantly in 1994 and then renovated in, in 2007. Now the library that was, which opened in 1975, this is uh, one of the earliest photographs of it in color. And it's really rather wonderful because it shows the fountains working and yay, the fountains will be working again. Um, pretty exciting news. But also on the uh, side of the image, you can see that the wonderful circular ramp that now is inside the building with the fountains was originally outside the building. And it's really interesting to me how many people don't know that. And when they find that out, it's like, oh my gosh, what, what happened here? So there they are um, as they were originally built outside the building and I just, Love the picture, so I had to throw it in. So before that, there was the library that never was. And this is a model of it. And you can tell it doesn't look terribly different than the library that was. Um, there are a few things different. And uh, we'll sort of look at those more closely as we go on. This is the lit up version, which I just think is fun. They stuck Christmas lights in it to make it look pretty spiffy. And finally, they stuck the whole, whoop. Are you there? Uh-oh. Didn't touch a thing. And the screen is dark. I see one image um, of a boy standing over a model. We yep. can see that. And all I can see is like my screen is starting over. It just it just went dark, turned blue and Oh dear. It's, not, it's not helping me right now. 
Kathy, can you... I can I can hear, but I can't see anything. It's just yeah, and I can't see anything, so I can't talk to you about it. Um, can you? Uh, you can't see anything on your screen at all. Nothing. Oh dear. And it just completely went dark, and so you know, it looks not... like Kathy is frozen. Yes. Kathy is frozen and it's now telling me I can't sign into my device. Well, shall I exit and re-enter? Let's try that. Let's just try that real quick. See I can that. see a picture of a little boy over a display case. And I wonder, that's awesome. I wish I could. <laughs> I always wonder who it is. Let's just, yeah, try to see. Okay, I'm gonna have to reboot, so just give me a second. Okay. There's nothing else for it. It's not doing anything. Else. Control Alt Delete is not doing anything. Okay, okay. restart. I'm going to restart. Okay. Sorry, right, guys, to bear with us, just the uh, fun of technology being involved. Let me see. Hopefully we'll be able to get this up and running in just a minute here. So just bear with us. Sorry, folks. Yeah, so it looks like um, Kathy is completely logging out of her computer and logging back in again, I think. So um, yeah, I just take her a couple minutes. So we'll sit tight. If nothing happens in the next five minutes or so, then we'll have to um, rethink our strategy here. But let's uh, cross our fingers for re, uh, her being able to re-sign on. Summer, on a side note, um, Walter Johnson was a literacy volunteer at Oakview way back when I first started. And I didn't know, he was very unassuming, didn't tell me who he was. Um, and one of the, another library employee told me later, like, no, that was the library director. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, so he was retired at that point? Mm-hmm. Volunteer, wow, that's yeah. amazing. He wow, was a, that's such a wonderful person, really kind. Yeah, must have really cared about the library. Oh, here's mm -hmm. Catherine and admit her. This is promising, you guys. Okay, let me meet, let me make her host again. One second. Are you rehosting me? Yes. <laughs> okay, so you're okay. co-host now. I honestly have no idea what happened. Let's fingers crossed it doesn't happen again. Okay, that's all right. We can be, you know, if this time has taught us anything is that we're adaptable, right? Oh, well, one hopes. Let's hope my dog <laughs> doesn't start barking. Okay, so let's go back now to share screen. I'm gonna try this again. Share screen. Here it is, I'm touching the screen. We're gonna convert this to a, to the slideshow. And there's that kid. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so I wonder who this 
It is. We've looked and looked. If anybody does know who this kid is, please tell me. Uh, here is that same model, and it's wonderful. A little glass house. And this is on October 22, which was the actual groundbreaking for the library itself. Now, who created the model and, and sort of what forces and interests and ideas actually went into that first vision of what the library should look like? And certainly we had a lot of people in the city who had worked on this, uh, not least of which was our librarian at that time, Walter Johnson, who made the case that we needed a central library, a new library anyway, put all the facts and figures and all this good stuff together. But also there were members of the public um, who were really active. Uh, I know um, Mrs. Charlene Bauer was just incredible in this, as was her husband, uh, Dr. Ralph, and there were many others as well um, who did this. They first attempted to float a bond issue to pay for the thing, which failed, but there was so much interest in it that the city put a public utilities board together to pay for it. So they decided they would let requests for bids out and see who they got. And what they got was a host of some of the most prominent and prolific architects in the United States. Probably the one that's most known to us locally um, today is probably Pereira. He was a Time Man of the Year, Time Magazine Man of the Year. And he's the one who created the concept of the University of California at Irvine, a city on a hill, which became sort of the urban plan for the entire city of Irvine. Um, but they narrowed it down uh, pretty closely. And two of the people they narrowed down, the same firm, were these guys, uh, Richard uh, Neutra, the elder gentleman, and his son, Dion, uh, to the right there. And these two were also incredibly prominent, incredibly prolific. And like others, um, they were, uh, they all had sort of their own gestalt. And the way the Neutras sort of saw life was sort of building on the way Frank Lloyd Wright saw life, which was that architecture and landscape had to work together. But most importantly for the Neutras, the survival of man depended on the quality of design and the quality of landscape. And he actually wrote a book on the subject called Survival by Design. Well, as fascinating as they all were, um, they of course wound up on the short list with other architects uh, and um, were taken out for a private meeting and discussion, sort of get their own personal viewpoint. And this is a letter thanking um, the city and especially the library board for meeting with them and giving them this opportunity. And it's not really exciting. The only reason I show it is it is the only piece of correspondence we have found and we have quite a bit now um, in that um, Richard Neutra, um, the father actually signed almost everything else was signed only by Dion. They decided, uh, the Library of Their Wisdom, that as much as they liked them, um, they really wanted to find out sort of what they were made of a little bit and what kind of library work they'd done before. So they reached out to two of the libraries that Richard Neutra had designed in the past and they kind of got mixed results. The first one was Simpson College uh, in Iowa and this is their Dunn Library and you can tell it looks nothing like ours except it does have some um, fountains inside of it that, that resemble some of our fountains. And the, the answer they got when they asked um, uh, for the qualifications opinion from the librarian there was, may I offer my congratulations and my sympathy on your choice of Richard Neutra. I have the greatest respect for Mr. Neutra as an individual and a creative artist, and I feel he did an outstanding job. However, I still cringe a bit whenever his name comes up. So it tells you something. Evidently, uh, the difficulties they had were because uh, Neutra really didn't understand how libraries worked. And in the end, um, they said, you know, and all in all, we like our library. There's three really sort of awful things though about it. One was the checkout desk, the rep was 48 feet long, which tended to quote, run the attendance ragged. Also, there was a massive open space that ran all through the building that channeled every sound to every floor and every corner of the building. So there was always a din. And the third thing that drove everybody nuts was that all the lights were connected. So um, every time you wanted to turn one thing off, you turned off the entire library. The next picture, I'll get rid of all these weird little things popping up here for no reason. The next picture is of the Adelphi Library in Ohio. And interestingly enough, Adelphi had a completely different reaction. In fact, they were so excited by Mr. Neutra um, that they actually made him an honorary doctorate. 
So a completely different reaction. And you can see that unlike the Dunn Library at Simpson College, there is some similarity. You see the circular stairs, a lot like our ramp. So there is some architectural uh, stuff going on there that's really interesting. And so with that, <clears throat> the city um, boiled down all the evidence, tossed this, tossed that, and decided they would actually award um, uh, the contract to Richard and Dion Neutra. And interestingly enough, um, on August the 13th, 1969, the Sun Dion wrote back uh, thanking the city for this really incredible, important commission. And one of the things he did was he cited a memo that his dad had written. I guess his dad didn't realize kind of what the word was on the street about him designing libraries. And he wrote to his son, you remember what a grand experience is all those other library jobs were? Wow, this is something to look forward to. Interestingly enough, three days later, senior uh, Neutra Richard uh, died, leaving the entire commission in the hands of his son. Now, interestingly enough, um, Walter Johnson had been the librarian for some time and had led the campaign to get a central library at all. Um, just was, was, from what I can tell, I never met him, I'm sure some of you actually have, um, was clearly a man of incredible vision, but also he was relentless. I, I look at his ideas and his writings and his correspondence and he just was going to make this happen. And I really wish I'd had the opportunity um, to meet him. He, uh, <clears throat> He developed, of course, the initial ideas about the library. And together with Dion Neutra, he put together this program for a new library for the city of Huntington Beach. This is the only known copy. And until we found this, we didn't know that there was such a thing. Um, you look at the table of contents, it's pretty bland stuff, you know, interior building requirements, technical services, I mean, staff room, it's got kind of a total bore. But if you look at what he actually included, uh, in there, um, you find out that he had some real vision. He wanted a local history room, art gallery. He wanted to really make communications important, especially between branches, the city, and the state library. For some reason, it was very important to get a hold of the state library. And for some reason, um, I, I guess he didn't consider the telephone uh, really, um, really enduring. Well, Dion and uh, Walter hit it off uh, very, very closely. Um, the phrase ticks on a dog comes to mind because they really just encouraged each other. Uh, and one idea that one had led to a bigger idea by the other one. And there was just this really wonderful uh, enthusiasm that went on. And in fact, one of the letters that we have uh, that just really sheds a personal light is Dion Neutra writing to someone else in the city. And he talks about how after a formal meeting, Walter and I spent several more hours drinking coffee, hours, mind you, drinking coffee and trying to go over the original program. With his attitude toward books and communication, we should be able to develop a most unusual complex. Now, the complex phrase there is, is really, really important because when we started looking at all of these drawings and documents, we were really thinking in terms of there was a library building. That was it. In reality, if you go back and snake through all the documentation, you find more and more what's referred to as a complex. This idea that, that this location uh, was cultural and educational, um, but also entertainment. And I think that has sort of fed to the modern uh, naming of the library as Central Library and Cultural Resource Center. So that whole heritage um, is, is really with us still, albeit in a, a really truncated form. So together, the two of them fed on these ideas and they created a master plan. They unveiled their master plan on October the 20th, 1970. On that very same day, the very first drawings of the building uh, as it was first imagined were released as were some really wonderful, remarkable sketches. And again, notice that tower thing. That, that's, that was off with the model and it'll, it'll come up again shortly. The um, blueprints like this were circulated to different people in the, in the city and, and sort of advisory groups. You know, what do you think of this? What, what's going on? And some of them like this one kind of cracked me up because on the one hand, the guy's writing in the margin, you know, what the heck is a space platform? Well, I probably would have asked the same question. On the other hand, he draws an arrow to something clearly labeled a ramp 
and says, what's this? And then this drawing is speckled with other, other queries. But when he gets to that tower thing in the middle, calmly just writes microwave. Same day, they release these pencil sketches of the very first floor plan ideas that come to mind. And of course, these changed constantly because you had the various floors and these constantly evolving ideas about what would be done on each and what was required to be done on each. But this is uh, one, this was actually done on September 8th, um, more than a month before the actual master plan and the original drawings were, were publicly released. Another one of his pencil sketches. This is interesting because it's the earliest ones we have. One of them, there were several like this, I only put one of each in, but those penciled in rectangles, if you look at the one, it's sort of in the middle, it says library, but each of those was intended to be another building. Again, this idea of a complex. And the funny looking thing that looks like a triangle merged with a rectangle, that was an outdoor amphitheater. So they were already thinking about, well, here's what the building looks like, but here's what the complex should look like. And so they released this rather um, wonderful drawing that actually labeled the buildings. And this actually is um, uh, October uh, 1970. So this, this is released with, with that. And I love some of the things um, that the buildings are labeled to be. Re recreation and activities, that's kind of predictable. There's a museum, an exhibit hall, which is sort of a trip because Johnson wrote that he expected the exhibit hall to house archeological, paleontological, and zoological displays. So I'm not sure what he meant by zoological. I don't know if he was thinking, you know, tanks full of lizards or if he was going to have an elephant chained in the, in the parkway. I have no idea what, what he thought was with that. But in any event, um, there was gonna be an artisanal hall where you could observe people making things and learn how to do it yourself. Graphics and amphitheater botanic gardens, and a greenhouse that was often labeled elsewhere as a biodome. So this is really, really incredible. Um, what they're sort of ignoring here a little bit is that we tend to think of this as a park and a library in the park. At this time, that wasn't the case. Central Park was sort of a barren, yucky wilderness with a couple of swamps in it, a, a quarry, a mushroom farm, um, a really ratty big drag of the water tower that at one point somebody wanted to make into uh, a thing you could climb up and see the city from it, but God knows what that was going to entail. And then um, my absolute favorite was it was also home to the police firing range. And so there was a lot of remediation that had to be done. So this wasn't necessarily you know, a lovely spot, but it was the top of the parcel of land. Well, the city decided that the graphics and stuff were great. And as all these things were evolving, that was wonderful. And as the ideas that, that Mr. Johnson and Mr. Neutra came up with sort of evolved, were sort of incorporated and looked at differently in drawings, they wanted to get some more information. So they sent off some of the samples of drawings to different people. And some of them were very lukewarm. Some of them were very enthusiastic. And then there's this guy, Wyman Jones, who was head of the Los Angeles Public Library. And he was a bit acerbic. Uh, his very first comment was, patrons will be confused. His last comment, working librarians are going to resent this building from the day the doors open. So he clearly was not a fan. I personally, like number four, never put the public on stairs if it can be avoided. And that's kind of a fun idea because it wasn't until 1971, the end of it more or less, that... Um, we really started to see the two elevators in any of the drawings. Up until then, there was no elevators. Um, there was, however, uh, between the beginning of 1971 and when the elevators showed up, a dumb waiter. And the dumb waiter uh, was going to go all different floors, and it was going to be housed where the elevator is now that's closest to administration. So you couldn't ride the elevator, but you could pull you know, books up and down. So this was sort of a, a very different point of view, I think. Um, than anybody was really expecting. So on we went um, with Neutra and Johnson working constantly together to come up with um, these very evolving floor plans and all these interesting ideas. And it was interesting to me because Walter Johnson especially um, was so visionary and, and he and Dion worked together so well. He was such a visionary that when the city continued to send these drawings out 
to consultants, SUA, Arthur Young, which today we think of as an accounting firm. Um, Walter Johnson would embrace every little suggestion and then writ large respond. So some of his great ideas, um, one of them was, you know, you probably have a, a refreshment area. So the next thing Walter Johnson worked in for plants was we need cocktails, at the very least a Hofbra. And that was taken into serious consideration. Um, when somebody else said, you know, the distance from where you've got parking now to the door of the library is a bit long. He responded with, we need a people mover. We're gonna get people from the parking lot to the front door on some sort of a Disneyland type apparatus. And finally, he just loved technology in many ways. And he wrote back to one of these consultants and says, do you have any ideas of what we can do with lasers? So just, I mean, oh my gosh, uh, who, who can even begin to imagine? So this is Walter and I've chosen this picture for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, um, I just love it. It's a, a picture of a fundraiser that the Friends of the Library had in March of 1975, which was over a month. Uh, before the library itself was formally opened in April. And it is a Friends of the Library event. And while I've got you here, um, I'm a member of the Friends. I hope you are too. If not, please go to fotlhb.com and learn about becoming a, a member of the Friends. Um, we, we'd sure love to have you. And here is Walter, um, sort of alone. The library has been built. Dion would still continue to visit him and the two men continue to correspond. But Dion's role really was over. And Walter was left to deal with the funding that had disappeared, um, trying to make do with little. When the library opened, there were hardly any books on the shelves. That's a whole nother topic of, uh, for another talk, how we actually got our books. Um, but he nevertheless never gave up. And in fact, he actually in 1974 tried valiantly to get a bicentennial grant uh, that would allow him to recreate two additional wings that among other things would house a genealogical society, the large theater that he'd originally envisioned um, and some wonderful craft spaces. Didn't win, unfortunately. The other reason I really love this picture is that it has those clocks on the wall. And I'm sure any of you who've actually been in the library, uh, you have noticed those uh, up, up, they're still there today. And they are really an important link uh, from the library that is to the ideas that created the library that never was. And those clocks are part of a three-part communication channel that was envisioned primarily by Neutra, but supported by Walter Johnson. And Neutra felt that the world was becoming an increasingly small place and that we would need to share information with each other around the globe instantaneously, that we needed access like that. And of course, you know, appreciate a man that he was uh, had not envisioned the internet. What he instead envisioned was a three-part method of getting this information. One is the clocks to allow people to know what time it was at the, wherever it was they were trying to get information from, whether it was Bangkok or Russia or Africa or wherever it was. The second was that bizarre tower that never got built labeled microwave because that's how he envisioned the information going from place to place. It would be transmitted by microwave. And there was supposed to be, and never was drawn, uh, but was described a booth right by the present reference desk that patrons would go in, like the TARDIS, right? If you're a Doctor Who fan, and you would sit in there and you would you know, dial up all your information, looking at the clocks to see what time it was where you wanted, you know, whoever you wanted to contact. And you know, there'd be your microwave and you'd type off your request and you'd wait and zit, 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 and you'd come your answer. So I look at that, um, those clocks, and I know other people see them, and, and rightfully so. It's just, wow, this is what time it is somewhere else. Um, but they really were part of a, a really sort of wonderful notion that never really came, came about. In, when we had the 40th anniversary of the library, um, of course, both Mr. Johnson and uh, Mr. Neutra have now since passed away. Um, but John Neutra came to the event and was incredibly proud to be there. Uh, the people in this picture left to right is Jill Hardy, uh, who's a current council member and at the time was mayor. See, our, in the back is, is Stephanie, our, our library director. Uh, the white-haired lady was Nora Brandle, Norma Brandle Gibbs. 
um, legendary character uh, in the city and just a, a, an enormous towering figure. Uh, Mrs. Gibbs was the first female mayor in our city. She was also the first female councilman and she was pivotal in getting the Central Library uh, funded and created. Of course, that's Dion Neutra. And then on the other side of him is uh, Barbara Doglace, who at that time was a councilman uh, and is still, but in the, media, in the meantime, um, has also been a mayor. Neutra sort of talked about some of the other things that they didn't get to do, that he really had hoped to do, not just his microwave relay, connect the world project, but he also talked about substitutions he had to make in, in the design because funds had so drastically dwindled by the time the building opened in 1975. And the two that really bugged him was the crenellated uh, front of our library all around the eaves on that wonderful, like a, I call it crenellated. It, it's, you know, bedded folded. That was originally supposed to be cast concrete, just like so many of our, of our pillars. And it was very, very expensive to do, very innovative. And so in the end, he had to settle for formed and bent metal. The second thing he really, really was unhappy about, but got over, was if next time you're in the library, if you haven't looked up at the ceilings, please do so. Uh, because the lath that looks like wood was supposed to be teak and it's actually painted metal, another, another big cost cutting uh, measure. And so he still, despite all of this, said that this was his favorite commission that he had ever had. And I, I really believe him. He looks like a pretty happy man. Uh, when the library was expanded in 1994, he hoped to be picked to do it. Uh, but by then, um, his firm had kind of narrowed down. I think he was close to retirement himself. Uh, and they did pick another firm, Anthony and Langford, uh, to go ahead and design and, uh, and, and, construct, and construct the building. So, Honestly, I'm going to see if I can go back to me now. Hi, it's me again. <laughs> um, I think sort of in conclusion, I think it's sort of a wonderful thing to recognize that there were all these wonderful ideas that came about starting in the days of the, li of the library that never was. Um, and they sort of wound up coming together and, and being made more modern. Uh, for instance, you know, my gosh, do we have an amphitheater? We do. Do we have a large and, and really important and wonderful theater space? Absolutely. Genealogical materials? Well, you know, it doesn't get much better than the Orange County Genealogical Society that, that operates there. Um, but I'm also really fascinated by things like the recreation of the artisanal halls where people could learn to do things and could see other people do things and sort of explore new, new technologies and new, new ways of, of um, interacting with the world. And, and I really kind of today look at our wonderful new makerspace. And I think in some way, you know, that's kind of the same thing in a very more modern updated, uh, updated way. Uh, this time, maybe you're not weaving, uh, but you're using a 3D printer. Wow. So we just uh, took that idea and, and modernized it. So really, I think um, it's wonderful to sort of look back on all these ideas, um, some of which were better than others. I know um, at one point, uh, Walter Johnson advocated that um, instead of seating in the general reading lounge, there should be mattresses on the floor so people could lay down while they read. And I'm trying to imagine what that would be like today with, with the climate we have, and my goodness. Um, they also, he and Dion thought a lot about what the inside of the library should look like and color schemes and all that, down to the most ridiculous things. They, they wanted to have um, uh, collapsible book carts, and I haven't quite got my head around that, but the one that really boggles my imagination is a self-emptying elevator. And I'm trying to imagine you get to floor number two and it, you know, pushes you out the door, the floor comes up and sends you flying. Um, so, you know, there were a lot of goofy ideas along the way, I think, as well. But the, the really sort of amazing, far-reaching ideas about what a library could be, that it was more than what both of them at various times called a storage place for books, um, I think uh, has really, really come to pass. And a lot of the reason for that is because of, of the foresight of, of Walter Johnson and the designs of Dion Neutra. So that's really all I have to share with you. Um, if any of you would like to see more of the architectural materials, they tend to be very large. Uh, some are very small, some are very large. So they're really hard to put in um, a presentation like this. 
uh, you know, if, if any of you understand about or are familiar with architectural drawings, you know, there are some that are, you know, two feet by four feet. Um, so th th those we certainly can't reproduce for something like this, but we, we do have them. And if at any time anyone would like to see or learn more about this, the collection is still unfolding. We're still identifying things and we're getting more and more digitized. Um, you know, gosh, please, please feel free to let us know. Happy to answer any questions you have. So with that, is there, are there any questions? Oh, come on, somebody's gotta have a question. Aha, the cats. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself? You're muted. There you go. Okay, hi. Hi. Um, I was interested, I was reading about um, the land that the library's on and how it was obtained and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, in um, looking at the newer section where the um, sports complex is and the ballpark, uh, was interested in in that area and um, had seen about uh, had seen some plans of um, I guess things that they were thinking about putting there, which of course was some of the ballparks and stuff, but some of the stuff did not happen. And I was uh, curious about the rest of that land over there where the um, where the, um, the police shooting range used to be. And then also um, back behind there, the lake, um, the Sully Miller Lake, that area. And what was, um, is that uh, area um, still in thoughts of being developed into something or has had that kind of just stopped for now? Well, I'll tell you what I know and what I've been told by people that have worked on that in the past, because I, I, I was also interested in, in that. Mm -hmm. um, first off, you know, the area that's the sports complex was, as you rightly identify, uh, the police firing range. And it's actually uh, the sports complex is sitting on a dump, basically. Right. It's a landfill. And they had to go through some pretty sort of tricky, committed, interesting engineering processes to compact all that. Uh, and I think that the word I heard was soil compaction and some other things, they had to vent gases uh, in order to make that stable enough for a sports complex. And I understand that that's a really great use for it because you really couldn't build a lot more on it. Mm -hmm. um, I've also heard really wonderful stories about the, um, the police firing range because that was definitely still there when they were looking at building the library. And they actually had to go over that uh, with a fine tooth comb and metal detectors. And this actually became part of the preview of the landscape architects, which is a whole nother wonderful talk. I'll tell you about that, they are an amazing bunch. Um, but they actually were going over them with metal detectors because they were finding you know, spent shells, but also unexpended right. bullets. Right. So you can imagine, here's a sports complex, let's let our kids play there. Um, not, not, not the best plan. So um, I will tell you, you know, the, the weird things that happened, the mushroom farm, of course, that was um, removed and demolished. And I'm sure you know about that. Mm -hmm. The uh, quarry and all of that became our very first adventure land playground. Um, so um, for those of you who may have lived here at that time, uh, really rather terrifying in this day of uh, litigation, but basically kids could go down there, play in the bottom of, which always had water in the bottom, and they would build all kinds of contraptions. The city would dump everything down there from old wooden wire spools to a, a, a bottomless boat. And the kids had to turn a nail in to get another nail, but they were free to build all kinds of things oh and build fires. So I'm really surprised that we haven't, uh, that we don't have a litany of litigation. Um, so far as I know, we kind of, you know, unscathed. Um, that of course has since been moved to the adventure playground we have today, which is you, a lot of fun, but much, much nicer. Are, are you talking about where the Sully Miller Lake is? Yeah. Wow. That was the original, that, and we actually have some wonderful photographs that we recently found. Um, there were some things we found, we have pictures of now that we didn't have before because we found four boxes of negatives of photographs that were taken in the 70s to early 80s uh, by our public information officer, but which were never developed into, into uh, prints. So little by little, we've been printing them and the things that we were finding are amazing. And fortunately, they were all stuffed in glassines on which he labeled what they were. Oh, wow. So we're able to take that, go, hey, well, hey, look at this, and then go back and do additional research and then really confirm um, what it is we're looking at, what we have pictures of. And some of them, you know, are not so great and others are a shock. Kathy? Yeah, hi. Hi, Jan here. Hi, Jan. Um, I remember that particular um, 
adventure playground because my oldest son is 50 so I took him there but there was no way they were going to get insurance and I knew they couldn't stay open oh. it was too impossibly scary the whole thing was unbelievably dangerous oh, but it was but it was a heaven it was a haven for children Oh, yeah. I mean, that, I know my boys would have both loved it, I, you know, and uh, you see these kids and they would build. There was one picture I have of this thing that's basically three stories high of plywood and stuff. And there's an easy chair at the top. And all I can think of is, how did they get that up there? And why hasn't it collapsed? You know, but the bonfires got me. And then the signs that say, keep out mom. I'm like, well, OK, that was, yeah. I don't think mom wants to go in there anyway. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was an interesting place, though. It was. It was. Anybody else? You've got to have something about the library. Hello. I have a question. Oh, here's Mr. Amory. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask uh, how much the presence of a park, I'm not even sure if Central Park was around at the time, but how much that affected the library plans? Mm, could you repeat that? Because you're kind of cutting in and out a little bit. Uh, how much did the presence of Central Park or whatever was there at the time would call, you would call Central Park how much did that affect the library plans well it was really important because the Central Park went through a few iterations but it was sort of always intended to be uh, a center for the community that would include hopefully a library although the library wasn't really accomplished as the uh, park was and the big problem with the park was they originally went in and bought some of this really nasty land that nobody else really wanted. And all the other surrounding land that they'd intended to sort of nibble and collect until they had all the property of Central Park, all of a sudden the developers thought, oh my gosh, there's going to be a library in the park. So yeah. if this the case, this property is going to be expensive. And so then it became kind of a race for the city to acquire land in advance of the developers doing it. So. It, there, there have been opinions that that sort of delayed um, the construction of the library, but I don't think so because the library is on the earliest parcel that we acquired. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? There's got to be something. I see one more uh, question in the chat from Susan. It says, what is glassine? Oh, we just got an answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It is, and you will have probably seen these there. You know, the long negatives that came in strips, the glassine is sort of a, a, a wax paper kind of a thing. It's not good for long-term storage of negatives. So if you have any, please get your negatives out of it um, as soon as possible. But uh, yeah, that's that's what a glassine is. Sorry, I, I say these things and I forget that, you know, that not everybody knows what the heck they are, so. Kathy, I have a comment about the, um... The area that Mr. Neutra originally um, uh, had envisioned as a as his workspace for people to connect with his microwave tower and all of that. Uh -huh. um, across from the reference desk, there used to be a set of I forget if there were three or four um, phone booths, and they were like encased in acrylic. So you were sitting in this little booth, and it had a little shelf in there, and of course the old phone. But um, people, I think, thought that those were soundproof and that no one could hear them. Oh and I think ultimately that no one could see them somehow magically while they're in there. And people would speak so loudly in those phone booths. Um, <laughs> I don't, I guess those must have gone out when they did the expansion. But um, yeah, there were three of them and they were right immediately across from the reference desk. And so I imagine that's what his little workstations for the, the um, you know, probably microwave tower spot. turned into. Yeah, probably that same spot. I actually haven't seen any drawings that have um, those as phone spaces. I will say that there is a whole bevy of weird technology that we don't know what it is that shows up in photographs. Um, since a lot of you are library people, you know that there's that horseshoe under what is now the genealogy um, area. And there's one photograph of that with this strange machine in the middle that it looks like you could watch TV on the top of it and talk with a telephone on the bottom of it and press buttons and get who knows what from the other side of it. And it's just sitting there all by itself. 
um, surrounded by what we call the apostrophe chairs um, that the library had for a long time, especially for the kids. And they kind of were shaped like apostrophes and fit together. And I think they wound up at Oakview um, eventually and wore out. But it, it, strange contraptions. I mean, we, we have no idea. I think they were just, I don't know if we just don't remember what some of them were or some of them really were so peculiar. I just don't know. Huh. I don't remember that either. Yeah, it's just odd, <laughs> weird things. Interesting. Thanks, Kathy. Oh, no, thank you. I didn't know anything at all about the, the phones, but I'm not surprised people thought they were phone um, soundproof. You think of the TV shows of the era, you know, you go in the cone of silence, you know, <laughs> and see that. So it was embarrassing for quite a few people. Well, today, cell phones is no better. People don't realize that their voice carries across the entire, you know, room. Mm -hmm. So that happens. Anybody else? Well, I do see some people um, that I know are retiring tomorrow and there she is. There's Miss Christine. <laughs> I'm doing it especially. And um, just wanted to say, you know, we'll miss you. I have missed you um, for, for all these months of COVID, but um, you know, you'll be back. <laughs> I hope. Thanks, and Kathy. I appreciate that. I, I, I have I have missed you and it's been kind of sad since we've been closed that we haven't had kind of been able to see everybody. But I just want to thank you for all this good work you're doing. You know, honestly, this stuff is in the basement. Nobody would have known it if you hadn't been digging around down there. So thank you for saving our library. <laughs> well, I kind of have to confess that, you know, normally my 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 work area is in the vault in the city clerk's office. And that's where our you know historical records for the city are housed. And when we first shut down City Hall, we all just got kicked out. And it was like, well, if you're not essential, you know, you can't be there. So I thought, well, you know, so I kind of messed around, messed around for a while. And then I thought, what else can I possibly do? And then I sort of lost interest in some of the projects I was doing in City Hall. And all of a sudden I thought, aha, the basement. And mm -hmm. thankfully, Stephanie was kind enough to you. Um, Stephanie Beveridge, our director, for those of you who don't know Stephanie, who's also retiring from which they're not happy about, um, let me in and uh, even bought me some archival file folders. So <laughs> anyway. Well, there's a wealth down there that we just honestly didn't even know about. So, you know, good for you well, for saving you know, a lot of that material. Down there that's really awful too. So mm -hmm. I think I've oh, yeah. like three or four dumpsters. Mm -hmm to say because things oh, yeah. were treasure two years ago at you know something or five years ago or 10 years ago you know nobody's going to reuse that dusty cremora or those christmas ornaments that have not been so you know no, I've, I've dug around in the basement i know how gross it can be so good for you for actually finding <laughs> all these treasures <laughs> Venus, did you want to say i see you lighting up occasionally did you have anything else you wanted to say no okay well is that it Okay, so you're all authorities on Walter Johnson and the library that never was and Dion Neutra and all that good stuff. And the next time you go, you're going to look up at the ceiling blades and say, my gosh, that looks like teak to me. He had me fooled. So, all right. Well, if that's it, um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. And also, if any of you have ideas for other Zoom talks, uh, topics you'd like to know more about, um, even, you know, reaching out to other organizations to help with that. Um, please let us know. Um, you can, you know, we'd love to have those ideas and we'd love to make sure that we're offering you content that you care about. So let us know. And with that, I'm just going to say thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it and your interest in our library. <laughs>